Today we speak with Andrew Winston, who is an expert on sustainable business, a business that thrives serving SDGs and the environment. His most recent book, which is called Net Positive, was named one of Financial Times' best business books of the year and is published in Italy by Evely. Winston is also one of the speakers of the World Business Book Forum of November that will be held in Milan. Thank you, Andrew. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, my first question will be, what's a net positive company. Uh, in the books you, you say it takes a courageous company to tackle uh, climate crisis and the income and inequality crisis. So what are the steps to follow to be one? Well, so let me just first say my, my co-author was Paul Pullman, who was the CEO of Unilever for 10 years and really I think one of the leading CEOs of big public companies trying to bring sustainability into the business. So this, this was kind of a, a joint effort to say we need to take business to a different level. And a net positive business is one that profits and grows by solving the world's problems, not by creating them and, and by increasing the well-being of everyone that they touch. Um, the question we're basically asking is, you know, is your business helping the world? Is the world better off because your business is in it? And the, the way to think about this kind of company is, that it really does have to start from a, a core purpose. I think that's been a big topic in business lately for good reason. Um, and we start in the book often with, you know, your own personal purpose that you as a leader, uh, manager, have to have a pretty good sense of why you're doing what you do. What's your, what's your purpose and duty? And then that kind of business has purpose. Um, and it goes kind of along a number of things that companies need to build internally to have the, the kind of the leadership. And that, that is building the kind of leaders, Um, getting the right kind of goals in place that are really taking into account the outside world, building trust and transparency with the world. And then, and then really the core of it is building partnerships and solving really big systemic problems through partnerships, sometimes with your peers and competitors, sometimes with NGOs, with governments. Um, and that's how you build an ongoing culture that is really trying to solve problems. So instead of asking a question like, oh, how can we, you know, decarbonize our business? What if it costs more? You start to look at why does it cost more if it does, or what's the problem in the way, and who do we need to bring to the table to solve it? So it's, it starts with a much kind of larger systems perspective of what a business can be in the world and how you can improve people's lives. You talk about purpose, and I think about the purpose trust of Patagonia. We all heard the news of Patagonia and its founder giving shares and profits to a non-profit, even though Uh, the, the family still has uh, voting power, still have a voice in the company. In the book, you and your co-author Paul Norman talk about companies that, that give back more than they can take. Is this yeah. the case? Is, is Patagonia the case? And without, will others follow? Look, I think I, Patagonia has been a leader for many, many years. You know, there's a survey every year by a company called Globescan where they ask sustainability executives and experts, you know, who they think the best companies are. Unilever, I think, has been number one for 12 or 13 years. Number two and three are almost always Patagonia and Ikea. And there's a handful of others, Microsoft or Google. Or, but I think Patagonia has been an example. You know, the, the Yvonne Chouinard, the founder, is he's been asked to work with Walmart over many years. You know, he's certainly met with Paul, my, my co-author. And, and it's because there really is a, a purpose and a mission there. I mean, they have they have made great products. They're still making a product that, you know, that needs um, manufacturing and has materials. But they've always had this mission, I think, of trying to solve the big problems. So they haven't solved them all, but they use recycled content as much as possible. They use renewable energy. They've gotten into the food and ag business, like, you know, food for, you know, travel and doing the kinds of outdoor activities that they support. And they've sourced that food to try to help build regenerative agriculture, the kinds of practices that sequester carbon. So I think their mission is to have a net positive um, impact on the world. It doesn't mean they do it perfectly in every dimension and neither does Unilever or any other leader. Um, there's still a lot of challenges to solve, but yes, Patagonia has been, I think, one of the few companies that's put this really at the core from the very beginning. Do you think that kind of action will be necessary in the future or Or I don't, I don't see any other comp many companies doing the same with their profits. Well, look, it, I mean, I, what 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 Yvonne Chouinard has done specifically in this case is say, you know, basically he's estate planning, right? He's saying I'm in my 80s. I've got to say what's going to happen to this company once once I'm gone in some sense. So he's putting it now into trust. And I don't, I don't think they've built that trust yet. And in many ways, he's put all his profits towards 
sustainability all along. But I think this tries to make it a, a structural decision, right? So that no one can come by it and then decide where they're going to point the profit. So really, it it's not that it becomes a nonprofit, but all of the profits will go towards the cause of saving the planet and saving the climate. I, I don't know if, if future families or you know wealthy owners of businesses will do similar. I, I think they, they probably will in many cases. Public companies maybe can't do the same thing. But the larger question of whether companies need to go down this path of pursuing that positive, well, yes, we kind of have to. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But the scale of the challenges we're facing, in particular climate, um, and I think rising inequality, make it so, you know, I don't think businesses are going to thrive or really stay very relevant in the world if they're not solving problems, if they're not helping the world improve and, and build towards a thriving world. I just don't know how companies are going to innovate and solve, you know, customer problems and give them the products and services they want. And maybe most importantly, how will they attract and retain talent when millennials and Gen Z want purpose? Right. On, you know, huge percentages say in survey after survey, they want to work for a place with with mission and purpose. I mean, that alone is a good enough reason um, for companies to do it. Most analysts say we're facing an economic uh, economic downturn uh, yeah. with the inflation being a major cause. So um, how will sustainability be affected by it? You know, it's interesting during the last really major downturn and besides the, the pandemic in 08, 09, I. I wrote a short little book called Green Recovery because my, my publisher, Harvard Press, said, you know, why don't you tell us why green still matters? And, and we called it green then. Now it's more sustainability or ESG, but it was really the same idea. Um, and the logic was kind of simple that a lot of the things you do to be more sustainable would help you during a recession, right? You, you get more efficient. You know, there's kind of a few buckets of value creation. One is just cost reduction. That's helpful, right, in a time where there's especially rising costs, right? You want to reduce the material flow in your whole value chain. You want to um, design things to be less material intensive. You want to use less energy, make your buildings more efficient, all of that. That all is in line, right? I think some aspects of the agenda are harder, right? How do you take care of people? We're in a time of, I think, leading companies trying to help pay living wages. Wages are rising. That's part of the inflation. And that has a long-term benefit for us all. As rate, you know, as wages generally rise or minimum wages rise, there's more people in the economy. That's good for business, but it does raise costs immediately. But I think it's hard to go back on that, right? There was some change in how we worked as businesses with employees, I think during the pandemic, some some changes in the social contract in, in many ways. So yes, there will be things that cost more, but by and large, sustainability helps you get through these times by being tight with resources and I think helping you build the kinds of relationships with stakeholders that help you when times are tough. I think more sustainable companies came through this pandemic better. They had a better network of stakeholders that they had built trust with, including their own employees. One last thing about what we thought would be a major boost to the uh, SG, uh, ESG will be the uh, ESG investing and finance. There will be a boost to the stakeholder capitalism and the shift from shareholder capitalism. But many, like uh, Elon Musk, talk about a scam. Is that the case? Well, look, I, I think we have to distinguish that the language in sustainability has gotten a little muddy. ESG has become the dominant term because it's what the financial world uses. But there's a really big difference between ESG as in the screen that the financial world uses to measure how risky a company is, how prepared a company is for the, the kinds of environmental and social pressures. How does climate affect a company? Is it a material risk? Those are important questions. It's actually, but it's pretty different from the world I operate in, which is corporate strategy and innovation and product development, which is which ESG just means more sustainable products and operations and services. Those aren't exactly the same thing, right? The financial world, we shouldn't be shocked, has a particular angle on things that isn't always reality. The stock market does not reflect exactly where a company is in success and failure. It never has. Um, and, and, you know, Tesla's an interesting example. Tesla in the stock market is worth more than all the other companies combined, which is on the face of it kind of silly, right? That's That means the market is assuming that GM and VW and Volvo and Ford can't get their act together and sell electric vehicles. Like that seems silly, right? So the stock market isn't perfect. On this question of how things are rated by investors, Elon Musk, for all the kind of nutty things that he says at times, I think he's basically right. He was complaining that Exxon got a good rating and his, you know, he got 
Tesla got kind of kicked off one rating. That is on the face of it, silly, right? On the macro level, it was partly from him. It was the G side of ESG, the governance, because he says things he shouldn't as a, as a CEO, like he does things that you shouldn't from a governance perspective. But Exxon has spent 40 years trying to slow the action of climate change. They, to me, should never be at the top of any anything that has environmental in it. They're they're not a leader. But it's about again how investors are measuring risk, not whether this company is actually good for the world. Um, and Tesla's done. You know, no one's done more for raising the profile of electric vehicles than Elon Musk and Tesla. No, you could never say that anybody's done more. Um, so yeah, that that particular rating. Thing, he was right. It was it was silly, and it's a silly outcome. So that and it should make us look at how these things are built, these ratings, and whether they're asking the right questions. I don't think it's a scam. I just think it's anarchy right now. It takes time to get the right metrics, and we're building it. And there's people moving pretty quickly. Mm -hmm.